right. So we welcome back the one and only Drew <laughs> Remenda. Thank Love God it. there's only one only. <laughs> I don't think my wife or my family could take more than one of me or anybody else for that matter. <laughs> well, hey, man, let, let's start with your return to being part of the Sharks broadcast, yeah. right? Again, it's been a, mm. been a hot minute since we've talked. And it's been since, great. Uh, I mean, you sound like you're having a great time with Rusinowski. Had a couple of hits with uh, with Randy, which I, of course I'd love to see more of. Yeah. Uh, you know, downside, of course, you have to deal with Brody once in a while. But uh, <laughs> uh, you know, my question is, you know, how fun is it to be back? It's um, who said it to me the other day? A good friend of mine. So not oh, no, Ray Rattle. Was it not Ray Rattle? <laughs> no, I'm kidding. Um, my brother said it to me the other day. He said, "You sound happy." And I haven't been happy for a long time. And I said, I am, I'm really happy. Like, first off, when I, I said this to anybody that'll listen, when you work with Danny, work with Randy, work with Brody, I mean, you work with pros. They're so easy to work with. It makes your job doing, or doing what Brett and I and Scotty and, and Curtis do. It's so easy because those guys are so good at what they do. And they, and they, they make us look way better than we really are. Well, me, I, I can't speak for uh, Scotty and Hannah and <laughs> or Scotty and Brett and, and Curtis are great, but it's so great to work with them. Danny and I, you know, we start, I uh, started with Rhett, with Danny. Yeah. And my son, uh, Davis, he, uh, he listened to the first broadcast and he, he texted me during the broadcast. And he said, Drewski, you sound great. Cause I was a little nervous coming back. I really was. I was nervous coming back because um, I was, am I same? Am I, am I the same guy? Do I, do I see the game the same way? I mean, you start to kind of doubt yourself in a way watching a different team, you know, will, will the shark fans remember me and, and like what I do now or how I do it now? And will the new fans like, and listen? And so there, I was a little, a little tentative. I don't get nervous. Like I just don't. Um, and then my son texts me and he said, Drewski, sound great. My, my son's never, they haven't called me dad since grade nine. So I said, Drewski, sound great, but Danny is the goat. That's just, just how great he is. But Danny and I kind of just hit it back off again. I mean, it's just, it was so easy. And then got to work with, with Brandy that, that one day uh, when Brett wasn't feeling well. And again, it was just fantastic. It was, it's been I don't know how to describe it, AJ. I really don't. You know, I know it's corny to say, but it's their family. I mean, everybody has been so great and so wonderful. I, I can't tell you that first game, how what that ovation meant to me. It surprised me. I was taken aback by it. And I'm so grateful uh, to everybody that has opened the door for me to come back. And, and there were a lot of people who said, yeah, come on back. And yeah, I can't thank everybody enough because it has been so much fun. And like you said, I mean, I, I am, I'm having fun again. I'm happy. I'm smiling. It's, it's been terrific. Uh, the, the ovation didn't surprise me whatsoever. Oh. The only thing that maybe as I'd sit there and go, well, okay. He was gone for, you know, five ish, six ish years. I don't... Yeah, wow. Didn't even yeah. feel that long, but yeah. Yes, it did. Trust me. Yes, it did. <laughs> <laughs> but it was just kind of like, okay, so there, there's probably going to be a, you know, a contingent of fans that. That's what are, I thought. Yeah, but no, it's a. The, was, even you may have been gone. It was like you know, there, there was still. It's, oh, you should have been here when Drew was here. Yeah. <laughs> I'll tell you what, I was, I was, uh, like I said, I was, I was, blown away and so humbled and grateful. And you know me, it's hard to humble me. So. <laughs> well, I'll tell you, I mean, this is, I mean, love Rusey to death, but typically I, I, you know, I catch the, the TV broadcast when I'm right. watching, but yeah. I'll tell you those, those ESPN games or whatever, I'm syncing you guys up on the, uh, with the TV <laughs> and I'll tell you, like, I, and I miss you doing TV, but your comment about Middleton reacting to scoring his second goal, like it was a 50 goal score. Oh, yeah. I was <laughs> howling. Right? How about that kid? <laughs> I mean, that. That they make me laugh. These kids, these nowadays. I mean, unless I like, I'm, I know. Send your first comment at okboomer.com. Yeah. But, but they make me laugh because they've got so much confidence. Like the one thing we talked to Middleton about, though, and he said it after I can't remember which might have been that game, 
when I said, you know, what are you, you've been a guy who's been toiling, man. You've been a guy who's been trying to stay up, trying to find your niche. Like, how are you, what are you thinking going into, into games now? And he went, I don't give a F. Sorry. You know, that's, that's what he said. Like he said, F. And he goes, I'm sorry. That's not polite to say on radio. I said, no, you can say F on radio. Trust me. <laughs> yeah. You can say F. You can't say yeah. fuck, but you can say F. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so, but he's, he's just decided I'm going to be me. I'm going to play like me. And I'm just going to go out and, and not worry what everybody else is thinking, which is a fantastically freeing place to be. And I've been impressed with him. I've been impressed with Ferrara. I've been, I was actually all the young guys that have been called up during the, during the vid and during just getting call ups for single games. They've been impressive. They've been really impressive. So yeah, but I, I like, uh, I like the group they got, you know, it's not like the old days though, you know, where we could, where you got to go in the room and got to hang with the guys, you know, I, I, I go in practice facility. I'd go in and I'd sit beside jumbo and, and we just BS away. Um, and then at the dressing room game day, as soon as Bernsey got out of his stall, I'd sit in his stall and, and talk to, usually it was jumbo, and, you know, just, you could, you could forge relationships with the guys and, and yeah. talk to them can't do that now so you got to glean what you can glean but when you watch these guys come on the plane or practice morning skates things like that you kind of get a sense of their personality and there's there's a few guys out there i like their i like their fire man i like their passion for the game and middleton's one of them well and you gotta like the fact that probably coming into the season he would probably have been the seventh guy had yeah. it not for been Kanijov going down. Yeah. And, and it doesn't hurt when it's, Oh, I'm going to be playing with who Eric Carlson. Uh, yeah. yeah okay. Feels good. I'm working. I'm there. I'm, I'm, <laughs> that's fine. And he's been, he's been terrific. He's been, he's been really good. Has not looked out of place, but yeah, when he scored that second goal, it was like, Hey, I do this all the time. No, you don't. <laughs> <laughs> well, and his first on a man net. <laughs> right. Who's, who's visiting you there right now? Oh, uh, this is Chip. He he's he he wants to be a part of the show. Chip, come come see me, Chip. <laughs> the old the old feller. Oh, hi, sweetie. Come on, come on, he's, oh. he's he's going to be uh, what eighteen, I think. In really? A few, yeah, in a few months. Oh. Old yeah. dude. Ah oh, man. <laughs> so we have we have Jeff. We have mittens. All right. Um, or Jeff depends on who you ask. Um, <laughs> if you ask the boys. Uh, her name's Jeff. If you ask Michelle and me, it's Mittens. He used to have George, my my boy, my bulldog. He died oh, yeah. in August, and oh, oh it, was, it crushed me, broke my heart, like broke my. He was my guy, right? Yeah. We, we got him through my my daughter and her ex boyfriend. They split up, and so we we got George when he was about two years old, purebred English brindle bulldog. Okay. Uh, more wrinkles than me. <laughs> um but well we we've had talks when you were out taking yeah, them for a walk you know yeah yeah they're my freaking neighbors yeah, hey, Drew, yeah. <laughs> so um would sleep with me had to be sleeping with me all the time um snored like an 80 year old man <laughs> I, and i loved him i mean i just i was just heartbroken when he died it was really sudden he was only six years old wow and um my, so the boy is the boys uh, said, "My Davis, my son, we're, we're driving to one day. I don't know where we're going." Davis said to me, "said Drewski." About a couple of weeks later, he goes, "Drewski, how you doing?" He said, "You still seem sad." I said, "I am, son. I really am." I said, uh, "You know, it's funny because I haven't shed. I didn't shed a tear when my father died. My dad died last year, and I said I, I, I didn't shed a tear when my father died. I said, but I have been crying like a baby <laughs> since George died." And Davis went, "Well, yeah. There's one difference. The dog loved you." Wow. wow. <laughs> <laughs> the chirping just never ends, does it? It was like, <laughs> I had to check to see if I was bleeding for crying out loud. Oh, my Lord. Oh, well, it's going to be hard I, to see. Animals are, say, and I was kind of always a cat guy because I love cats because they're arrogant like me. <laughs> you know? so i really I, I enjoyed the cats and, and and cats would come over to you to okay you may pet me now yep and then it's okay screw off enough of that and then they they had this they only needed you when they wanted something 
which yeah. is exactly like me. Um, and so the other, and the, and the dog, but then the dogs, like George just stole my heart. I mean, so I've been, they've been saying, everybody's been saying, you know, go get, go get another one. I'm like, uh, he's not going to be George, you know? So. Yeah. It's when, when the time is right. I had, yeah. I had a, uh, uh, an Australian cattle dog for a oh, while and, yeah. uh, and they're just so smart and so quick. Yeah. And so, yeah, uh, it, that was devastating when he yeah. passed on, but yeah, this, this one, I'll tell you dog like, but, yeah. but yeah, I, I do appreciate the, yeah, the cat thing where you're kind of like, Hey, I got to leave for a couple of days. Litter box is clean, food and yeah. water topped off. All right. We're all good. I'm good. You go ahead. I'll take and care they can, of right here. Yeah. And they could give a shit. You know, <laughs> you're gone for two days and it's, oh, you're back. All right. Whatever. <laughs> <Exactly>. <laughs> so, uh, okay. Watch this segue. Uh, yeah. so <laughs> we're essentially a third of the way into the schedule, a little more, um, sharks have only played four Pacific division games, which yeah. talk about an odd scheduling quirk. Uh, <laughs> oh, whatever. Okay. But, uh, you know, took two against Calgary lost. Seattle lost Vancouver. Um, how important are these remaining Pacific division matchups going to be for the Sharks if they have to, if they happen to have any hopes of playoffs? Huge, obviously huge. And yeah. I, I, I didn't like their game against Vancouver very much. I know Bob Boogner was really supportive of the team, and I, Bob's just doing what good coaches do. You know, he's he knows the the, the team he's got. He knows they're young. Um, and he talked about their energy. I, I wasn't as crazy about their energy as he was. I thought that they were, it was just, there wasn't enough sustained energy. There wasn't enough sustained coming over the bench line after line after line to get momentum and keep momentum and, and put the pressure on Vancouver. And um, I thought Andrew Cogliano after the game was really good in what he was talking about when he talked about desperation and urgency and there's got to be more from the guys. I thought, he, I thought he really did a good job of summing up how they played. They were okay against Seattle, um, but those, those are two games that were certainly winnable, but they just didn't give you enough. And that's been very rare this year with this team. Yeah. The one thing that you can say about this team, as compared to last year, say when we talked, is this team maxes out. When they have the opportunity, they will give you what they've got. It may not always be their A game when it comes to execution, but it will be a game where they will give you whatever they've got in the tank. And so I didn't think that was the case against Vancouver especially. Um, so when you go forward and you look at the Pacific Division teams, I think when you look at the Pacific Division teams, there are some surprises. I think the Sharks are a surprise being – at 500 team. I think the, I think the, obviously Anaheim Ducks are a surprise. Nobody saw that coming, no. but Dallas Aikens, who was in, um, was in Edmonton when I was there my one year, he, he coached most of those guys, those young guys in San Diego with that AHL team. Dallas is a hell of a coach. You got a bad rap in Edmonton. He's a hell of a coach. You know, well, you know what? Yeah, AJ, they're all good coaches at this level. <laughs> you know, they really are. That, that was actually something that I wanted to bring up with you later, but now that you've touched on it, okay. is the fact that Dallas had that opportunity to go with those guys through San Diego, yeah. and now you see the way that he has really helped develop those guys and bring them along, and how they've contributed big time to Anaheim. Is that something that needs to happen? I'm not saying Roy Sommer needs to come up and replace Bob Bugner, but it, like, how is it that we haven't seen more stories of like, a Barkley Goodrow or a Tommy Wingles, like a few more players that have actually marinated with the CUDA for a little bit and were able to make that jump and be big contributors. Cause it's very far and few between. Yeah. I think because of the way the team was beforehand, where it was, they were, those guys weren't getting a lot of play because the team was so stacked when you had Joe and Joe and Patty and, and Danny Boyle and Danny Heatley and, Wingles and all those guys. I mean, there were, you know, Tommy was a third line guy, maybe fourth line guy. I mean, Brent Burns played forward for crying out loud. That was a stacked, sexy team. That team's not like that anymore. So that's what there's, that's what they're doing right now. They're trying to develop the, that pipeline that feeds the big team. And they've had to, 
kind of revamp the way they were always thinking and the way they were always building the team. Because for us, as we know, and we were spoiled for such a long time, a perennial contender with like the Sharks were always the spicy pick. The Sharks yeah. were always like, wow, look at this team. They're so talented. You know, from, from the net out, they were, they were good for a long, long time. Yeah. And then like every team, Colorado, Dallas, that were the powerhouses when the Sharks were the powerhouses. Yeah. Anaheim, LA, your window closes and your guys get older. And the game start to drop and guys go to free agency and you bring this guy in and this guy in and can't pay the money to that guy. Got to pay the money to this guy and your team changes. It goes through a, a metamorphosis. And um, I can't remember who said it the other day, but I was reading the only way that you can build a team nowadays in the national hockey league used to go, you could go make trades, get free agencies and things like that. The only way you can build a team that's a contender nowadays in the National Hockey League is through the draft, is through development. You go look at Tampa Bay's team. Look at how many guys were drafted and how many guys were developed through that organization, how long it took, yep. and how patient they were. But it goes all the way back to Jay Feaster being general manager to then um, Brian Lawton to then, or maybe that's, I don't know, not sure which guy was first. <laughs> then it goes to Steve, then it goes to Julian Brisbois. They, they drafted well. They drafted really well in the middle guys. Their middle guys were really important in this last two cup, or this last cup run. Um, their top guys, you know, they're, are their top guys. But then they added later on when the team started to gel, started to get to that point, started to marinate where they're going to be one of the best teams. Then they went and got real smart free agents and real smart trades. And then there's, of course, you become the destination place, right? Yep. Guys want to come to you. So you make one, two really smart, but not too expensive free agent, not too expensive in term and not too expensive in price where you get these free agents and they, they really put you over the top. But that's the only way you do it. So the Sharks right now, like Arizona, like Anaheim and Los Angeles, Colorado's already gone through it. Dallas is kind of in that, they don't know where they are right now. You know, they're, they're trying to hold on to that team that was in the bubble, but they're, they're not that team anymore. So the, the Sharks are trying to develop their guys. I think they're doing a good job based, based on what I've seen this year of the guys that we just, the young guys we talked about. And then you start to get some drafts like Ozzy Weisbach. Weisbach's pretty darn good up here in Prince Albert, not about 90 minutes from here. Um, they, they've got some, some, um, good players, but it's, it's, it takes some time. It takes some time. That's the only way you do it nowadays in the national hockey league. No, there's clearly some pieces. I mean, you look at the way Brandon Coe is just decimating the OHL. Yeah. Uh, you know, He's Tristan, up in <laughs> I mean, uh, Tristan Robbins, uh, you got Bordalo. There are definitely some pieces there. Daniil Gushkin, there are pieces to be excited about, but feels like you know we're three four years away from seeing the return on investment on those yeah I, yeah I, I, yeah I, I, for me it's hard to even like i don't even know you know i i i am notoriously bad for ignoring farm teams and draft choices are uh, you I playing mean, tonight are you playing tonight in the game no man <laughs> i don't even know who you are <laughs> well i mean hobgawax the other night finally gets a look after you know being with the oh, cool nice job there I didn't, even, I didn't even attempt it during the broadcast. <laughs> didn't even attempt it. Randy said it like 128 times to get it, you know, to get it, make sure he had it. Oh, I, I, so, I listened to uh, the radio and, and right. holy, Rusey just perfectly. And it's actually that last one. It's, you know, it's almost, it's not a W. It's almost like a W, like Helga Vox, yeah. you know, he, he nails it. Guess what? If I wasn't, if I was broadcasting that great game with Danny, that kid wouldn't have never touched the puck or been on the ace. I would have <laughs> never mentioned it. I would have called him Jordan. I was. Been... <laughs> well, I'm telling you, uh, what well, Jaden? Jaden, sorry. Yeah. yeah, see. But we we'll see. You know what we call him here is Scrabble, just because his name would be the best score ever, right? <laughs> That's good. That's good. Yeah. <laughs> you just call him Hobbs or something. Yeah. Yeah. But, um... That's when. That's one where you have to. You know, there's some broadcasts out there that. Uh, to, Call guys by their their nicknames. 
which oh. drive me absolutely crazy. I but, don't remember you ever referring to Nolan on the air as Buster. No, no, <laughs> never once. Um, but there was no this, mush, none of that. <laughs> no, there'd be one guy. This guy, though, I would, I would probably go with the nickname. Yeah. <laughs> Well, I mean, glass half full for this season. I mean, you have to be pleased that Timo in particular and Eric Carlson have bounced back or or at least are playing to what we've expected because oh, yeah. the last two seasons, not great. Yeah. I, I, I tried to do a package on Eric Carlson uh, last game, but I, I, my video wasn't very good. My fault. Um, it's hard to, hard to see Zoom when you're, you know, thousands of miles away going, oh, is that Carlson right there? I screwed up there. <laughs> Um, I think my way through, but I was, my, my son even came up, Donovan came up, went, what were you talking about? I just, never mind, go away. Um, so Eric Carlson obviously feels better. Oh, yeah. Nice. Mentally, he seems to be in a really good spot. He, he, the three things that strike me with his number one, his skating, his, his closing speed and his, his separation speed are or quickness, not speed, quickness, are back. Yep. Right? He can turn and close on a guy like that and his separation speed, he gets in two steps, he's got space. He's shooting the puck again, and he's not giving the puck away nearly as much, not even close. Not so, nearly as much, but that was a pretty key giveaway oh, Vancouver oh, right there in the neutral zone. Oh. <laughs> but you, you know, it's funny. It was, it was Ken Hitchcock, I think, a long time ago when he was coaching um, Columbus. And I can't remember the player we're talking about, but it was the Russian kid that was a high draft choice that shouldn't have been a high draft choice. Um, <laughs> Feels like and, there's a lot of those. Yeah. Even Doug McLean, who drafted him at the time, was that, that was my fault. <laughs> um, and it, like Dean Lombardi used to say, every, every GM's got one. Some GMs have more than one. No. Um, but he said with this player, Let's say he, he goes into the zone, carries the puck into the zone 10 times, right? Four of those 10 times, they're the most heinous giveaways on the planet, maybe even five. He said, of course, as a coach, I'm going to, when he's coming back to the bench, I am going to get on his ass because he can't give the puck away in that position. You can't give the puck away going across their blue line, the transition game gets kicked the other way and you shorten the range for the opposition. He said, so I get on him and I get on him and I get on him. And then I realized it's not helping. That's not helping. So why don't I concentrate instead on talking to him about the six or five or six that are really great entries into the zone and the one or two that he makes an incredible play and you get a chance on net. Maybe if I highlight those, maybe if I talk about those, Yep. then that'll help spur. And I thought, yeah, okay, I get it. But when he gives those ones away, you're, he's killing your team. But he also said, yeah, but guys who handle the puck a lot are going to have a lot of giveaways. Joe Thornton. Yeah. Joe Thornton, when he was at the top of his game with the Sharks, was one of the top giveaway guys in the National Hockey League. Why? Because he had the puck all the time. It's like Babe Ruth and strikeouts. It's just what's going to happen, yeah. but where you give it away, like you just mentioned, that's, that's important. Yeah, as that far as huge. Timo goes, as far as Timo goes, again, not very familiar with him. Like, like you are and a lot of the Sharks fans that have been around forever and, and, and Danny and Brett and, and, and Dan and Randy and all the guys. But what I see from him this year that I didn't see last year was a willingness to go inside, to play inside. And when you're playing inside, that means a lot of different things. Obviously, inside the zone, trying to gain the middle of the ice, trying to go to get to those high danger, high potential scoring chance areas. But it takes a little bit of you know what to get there, right? I mean, it takes some heart to get there. You better be willing to take a hit or two. I didn't think he did that last year. I thought he stayed in the perimeter. But also when you play inside, it is playing inside your opposition so if you and i are going for the puck and it's a 50 50 puck i i'm willing to put my body get my shoulder inside your chest and get over the puck get my nose over the puck again you're going to take some punishment down but he's more willing to do that 
he's a big kid. Yeah. Like he's a thick kid. So I think he's starting just to understand that, you know, I can play this type of game. I can be a raw power forward and it's going to work for me. We all said this was going to be an important year for him. Oh yeah. And you know, he, he has, and it was interesting like last game, you know, Randy talked about, was it like seven or eight games? He hadn't, he hadn't scored yep. and he gets two dynamite chances in the first period. And I text uh, Chelsea, who was the producer on the pre and post. And I said, give me those chances. Cause I want to talk about those chances in particular. And then he scored. I said, give me the goal too. <laughs> so we, we had to go with something else, but. Todd McClellan told me this, Jacques Lemaire, you know, he worked for Jacques Lemaire when he was in the Minnesota organization. And in, on losing streaks and winning streaks, Jacques used to say, when you're on a winning streak, your game starts to go bad before you start to lose. And when you're on a winning, when you're a losing streak, your game starts to get better before you start to win. And I think it's the same thing with guys who are goal scorers. They're, they, 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 when they're in a slump, when they're in a little bit more streak where they're not scoring, their game starts to get better before that puck starts to go in. And you could see it with Timo. He was getting chances. He was getting shots. And then those two chances, and then bang, you got the goals. And, 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 you know, as well as I do, Jesus, as soon as those goal scorers start to get hot, you know, they go, they go for a while. They burn, they burn long. Well, I'll tell you the, the thing that really stood out for us when we, we've been talking about him over the course of this season is the fact that he was known as kind of a red ass when he was playing with the CUDA and the fact that he's been able to pull all of this off while having like no penalty minutes yeah. has been shocking. Yeah. It's the, but you know what? I don't mind. I don't mind guys that play like that. Obviously, you know, there's a, there's a coach who used to say, I'd rather put, have to pull a guy back from the edge than push him to it. You know, if, if what it takes is to for you to play your game is to get to some emotional some state with playing with that much emotion that much anger go do it but like you said he's been very disciplined as far as penalties go this year which which is great i mean he's he's starting to really mature as a hockey player yeah i mean you look there was a couple times that Owen Nolan flipped his shit during a game, you know, and he hey. go, look, was, who was it? Was it Jason Marshall that he liked? Jason just, Marshall. Yeah. 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 So, you know, Timo. I got, I got in trouble for that one, man. Well, what happened? When, when he hit, uh, when he hit, was it Marshall? I, I'm pretty sure it was Marshall, yeah, wasn't it? So remember, he, he, they had to stretch him off the ice, remember? Grant, no, Grant Marshall. Was it Grant Marshall? Oh, oh. It was either Jason or Grant. I can't remember. <laughs> so, but it was right I, there. I love, I love Buster, right? I love Buster. Oh, yeah. Buster and I were close. But I, I, if, I, I, if, I, if I recall correctly, you were like, Nolan, what the fuck are you doing? You know, <laughs> what I said was, and I, and I knew, like, when it happened, it was Grant Marshall. <laughs> when it happened, because he hit, he hit Owen earlier in the game. Yeah. Oh, and Nolan knew how to take a number, boy. Yeah. And so when he hit Grant, um, I'm on the air and I'm thinking to myself, be careful, be careful, be careful, be careful. Okay. And so we watch the hit again and they, they keep showing it to me. And I'm thinking, don't say a fucking word, right? <laughs> and but you can't, right? You've got to say something. Yeah. And I said, you can't condone a hit like that. I understand why he did it but you can't condone a hit like that. Well, what I didn't know at the time when I know now is that when you are a general manager and a player, the NHL will play sometimes the audio back of the whole situation when you are, especially to the general manager, okay? Mm. Our general manager is Dean Lombardi. Again, a man I absolutely adore and love, okay? Who's been great to me. Um, and I think the world of Dean. But Dean, like, we all loved Buster. We all loved Owen. We, we all love Owen. But Owen was Dean's guy. Oh. Like, that was his big trade, right? Oh, and yeah. Owen was, and, Dean, and Dean loved him. And why not? Why wouldn't you? Played the game the way that we loved the game being played. 
Well, and so you I look said, at the, the piece that they gave up to get him. I mean, yeah. Ozil Lynch, pretty big player. Yeah, Dennis was pretty good for Colorado. Yeah. So I said, I understand why he did it. And I understand what the situation is, but you can't condone a hit like that. And they played it. They played the thing and Dean's watching it. And I don't know how he heard it or whatever, but however it is. But anyway, it gets played back to him. And of the NHL says, even your own broadcaster uh, says this. That, ha- that happened more than once to me, by the way. <laughs> and well, God hate you for being honest, right? Well, yeah, but the, yeah, well, as uh, the great Greg Jameson once said to me, just because you're right doesn't make you bulletproof. Yep. So Dean was pissed, like <laughs> pissed in the office, come see me. What the f- are you doing? Like, <laughs> chewed my ass out. And I'm thinking, but Dean, I was right. Dean, you can't hit a guy like that. You know it. So everybody's pissed. Everybody's mad at me for that. <laughs> I don't, was, it Ron, was Ronnie coaching then or was that Daryl? Whoever oh. it was. I no, I, I'm pretty sure sh- that had, oh boy. I have to I go back and look. That feels like that was Daryl. Yeah, I think it was, anyway, everybody's pissed at me. Yeah, it's, I think it was Daryl. It was Daryl. Everybody's mad at me, like everybody, except one guy. <laughs> Owen Nolan, right? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so I go to Owen when I first time I see it, I said, Oh, I'm sorry. I said, He goes, I know what you said. I said, You're right. Don't worry about it. Because well, he got, didn't he get like 10 games for that? Yeah. Yeah. He got like a huge amount. He goes, don't worry about it. It's not your fault. He said, peanut. He called me peanut all the time. <laughs> he said, peanut, don't worry about it. No fucking problem. So, they were, you, know what, you know how he called me? He ended up calling me peanut. It's my only nickname I've ever had in my life. Okay. It was peanut. And Owen called me peanut. And another guy, Andy Sutton and Brant Myers started it because <laughs> they used to play on the plane. They sit behind me. And they would play BS poker, you know, with the with the with the ten dollar bills of bills, right? Oh, yep. And they would play BS poker all the time, and I would stand up and I'd watch them play. And I never never understood the game or how they played it, and you know that I didn't actually understand that that BS actually was you're supposed to BS the guy. Um, and I would make comments, and finally Andy one day looks at him and goes, "Hey, no comments from the peanut gallery," <laughs> and Brett Myers goes. Oh my God, that's his nickname. <laughs> that's his nickname, Peanut. That's your nickname. And so they would call me Peanut all the time. And then Owen, and by the way, anybody out there and any of you call me Peanut, you, <laughs> we're, we're going to have words. <laughs> so Owen so Owen called me, uh, so Owen started calling me Peanut, but he would call me Peanut on the air. Oh, Jesus. Stop, please stop. <laughs> but it got so bad, Andy Sutton, we were in Florida and Andy Sutton and I, we would, we would work out together when Andy would, you know, was part of the black aces. So we went to this gym near the hotel, really good gym near the hotel. Um, and Andy and I go in and, and Andy goes, I'll sign us in. I went, okay. And he signs oh, uh, sure. P <laughs> nut gallery <laughs> <laughs> to the point where the manager had to come over and goes, um, could I get your real name? Uh, what are you talking about? And he showed me the <laughs> sign in. <laughs> Oh my God. But anyway, yeah, so that hit, that hit, I got in a ton of trouble for. Like, but one guy that didn't get mad at me was always. Hmm. Well, uh, I know that that all segued off of talking about Timo. Yeah, sorry, and, right? Yeah. No, it's all good. I love to do it. I'm telling you, you got to write a fucking book, man. <laughs> I will um, on the day I retire so I can, so I don't have to worry about getting a job in the NHL. <laughs> uh, pseudonym. It's all pseudonym. Oh, yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you already have it. P, nut gallery. <laughs> uh, glass half empty, though. I mean, we talk about how great it's been to see. Carlson and Timo bounce back. Uh, you're getting, uh, I mean, <laughs> I'm not going to say Vesna type goaltending from Reimer. Mm-hmm. Certainly yeah, all star. Yeah, <laughs> been great. He's been fantastic. Yeah. Hill, uh, you know, last time I looked, his numbers are actually a little lower than Martin Jones right now. I, yeah. you know, that needs. I, I to... think Aiden. Let's let's start with Aiden. 
Aiden, I, I don't think, you know, one of the reasons they got him, we were told this, is that they really liked the, how he made the high, the, the saves on high quality chances in the AHL. Um, Evgeny's been working with him, and I talked about this last game, about trying to stay big. And Aiden has, his, has a tendency to get his hands in. And when you get your hands in, your shoulders droop and you, you go small. He's a big guy. Use your size. And if you watch Evgeny with him at practice, he's always working on getting your hands out, right? Okay, because just hands out, shoulders come back. Um, and you stay big. The, the thing I will say about Aiden, he's 60-plus games into his National Hockey League career. Yeah. 60-plus NHL games. So I'm thinking is that he is, he is, they're hoping that he grows with the team. I'll go with that. James Reimer has been delightful, not only to watch in his game, but to be around. There is, you know, it's why we love veterans, right? You know, <laughs> the only way to get there is because of experience and he's, he's experienced it all. Um, a guy who's so, easygoing and relaxed, nice man. I did say to him the other day when we were uh, taking off on one trip, I was standing there and all these guys are driving in and their F-150s and all the other have, and he comes driving in a Porsche and I, he gets out and I said, you know what? That's probably why I like your rhymes is because you're still one of the NHLers that drives a nice friggin' car. I said, good for you, man. Good for you. And he started to laugh. You know, Bernsey comes driving up in a 1957 Chevy truck, and then there's guys in F-150s and everything else. And <laughs> here comes this white Porsche just rolling in in California, which is the way it should be. <laughs> oh, absolutely. No, he'll, I mean, you you talked about it last game where it's like the book is out, that glove side yeah. high. We need to fix that. Yeah. yeah. Up here. And then, they are, you know, they're working on it. I mean, it, they, he is a work in progress without a doubt. I like his attitude. I like the fact that he doesn't mind a little mirror therapy every once in a while. I, nope. I like the fact that he works his ass off with your Guinea. And, and I think I, you know, that, that he will grow and, and, and become a better goalie. He also seemed to be uh, at least early on in the season, there was a lot of talk about the way he would just TV timeouts. He's going over to the bench, you know, going, Hey, yeah. come on, let's go. Fuck the juice. go yeah. You know, yeah. I like the juice, man. I like the juice. So yeah. Don't mind that at all. Um, Kevin LeBanc. Yeah. That's the, you know, that's, the, that's fourth highest paid forward. And, you know, obviously shoulder surgery, he's going to be out two to three months, yeah. but uh, you know, in your estimation, do you think LeBanc got a fair shot to make the top six and just didn't show enough? Or is he in Bugner's Chateau de Bow Wow? Or no, just... I think that's a good question. Um, I looked at Kevin at the start of the year and, you know, it was with the one time around that power play off the, off the, his off wing, he was just drilling the puck and he can shoot the shit out of it. I mean, he's got a great shot. Um, Is it that he just but, doesn't have someone to feed him? Well, I'm wondering about that. You know, like there's, you know, there's, when you look around, you like to see, okay, what if, what if this guy played with that guy, this guy played with that guy. And so when you, when you were working with depth, um, it's, you're going to try to continue to try to move guys around, move, move the pieces around to see if, if it works. That top line, you don't want to mess with. No. Well, sorry, Logan Couture's line, you don't want to mess with. They've been trying to find with Tomash, with Barabanov, and um, with Balsers. Balsers. Um, they've moved and guys in there. there. They've, so they're trying to find something that will continue to work and get. I like the third line. I like the third line. They work their ass off. The, um, oh, seen, well, hold Benino on. and Benino and Cogliano and Nieto. The, 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 your O line. Yeah. Everybody, know, everybody is O. Yeah, real life. Yeah. <laughs> oh. um, so I don't know with Kevin. I think Kevin is one of those guys, and I, again, not getting a chance to talk to him much, but he seems like a, one of those guys that takes the heat to heart. Mm. You know, I think he gets on himself. He, He's, I think he, well, like every professional athlete, like everybody who's playing in the best league in the world, you demand a lot of yourself and you expect a lot of yourself. And for him, he's expected to score goals. Nobody comes to the ring thinking, I just want to be even today. I just want to be plus one. Nobody does. In fact, with your kids, your kid would go, go to the rink, go play a game. My kids still go play games with, you know, in the adult league. They come home. I say, you guys win. Yeah. 
what's my next question? Score any goals? <laughs> yeah, everybody does it. Every kid, every from from here on. So or every parent on. I mean, you just that's what it is. So everybody goes trying to score goals. So I think when Kevin doesn't, he takes that to heart. And and the one thing I'd I'd say with Kevin is, okay, you're not going to score every night. You try to score every night, but you're not going to score every night. So what are you working on? What do you do? What is what do you do? Tell me when you're not scoring how you can make an impact. And listen, I, I think Johnny McLean and John Madden and Reach are great in that regard. I think they're good coaches. And they, you see them working with guys and talking to them before practice. They've got a really interesting uh, coaching staff who are very different in their personalities, but very good in how they work with the players. And Bob gives a lot of feedback on the bench, too, if you ever watch him. But I would, I would sit Kevin down when he came back. And once he gets back into the rotation after the surgery, and he's going to be out for a while, like you said, I would say, okay, we always try to score, obviously. But when you're not scoring, what else can you do to make us a better team? And try to get that in so that he builds that confidence. You know, confidence is a funny thing. Trent Yanni has a saying, you know, you don't lose your confidence, you choose to give it away. And in a sense, that's right. I mean, because you couldn't have got where you've got. You couldn't get to the National Hockey League without being confident in who you are and what you do as a hockey player. But um, everybody in junior, everybody in the minors, everybody in college, when they get, when, when they're at that level and they're about to be an NHL, they've all scored. They've all been top players on their team. They've all been really good and made an impact and never had to worry about confidence. Then you get, and there's other, there's 600 other guys who are, holy geez, these guys are good. <laughs> so, you know, you, and coaches play into it and the games play into it. And the fact that you get the grind going and the fact that, you know, that the goalies are really damn good here and all these things play into it where you start to really question who you are and how, what you can do as a player. So I think, to me, just, and then this is from, you know, 30,000 feet, but I watch Kevin and I think that he really wears it when the puck doesn't go in. I got you. Well, what, what is it? Uh, pretty fucking easy from up there, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. yeah Jeff Durham, yeah. <laughs> hey, Drew. Yeah. <laughs> great. Uh, those, those are great days, man. Great days. Well, didn't you, well, I thought at one point you had said something, was it confidence or something where you were just like, you know, oh, you you lost your confidence. Okay, well, where'd you see it last? Yeah, what do you yeah, mean you lost? Well, exactly. Yeah, exactly. But where'd you see it last? When where, where did you have it last? And then we'll go we'll go back there. We, yeah. we, when you were on the coach, was did you have it then? Because I can go check in the cushions if you want me to. <laughs> there, there was a time when I was, well, was it time now, where I was at an a hole about these types of things, and I used to be that guy. Suck it up. Come on, let's go. Get mentally tough. Come on. That's what it's all about. Now I coached in the nineties, you know, yeah. coaching's changed now. Coaching's changed now to the point where if you can't say that to people anymore, you have to try to work with them and, and, and get them to understand that you care about them, get them to understand that you believe in them, get them to get the, get them to open up to you so that you can Find a way to make them better. It used to be we would tell you what to do, and that's it. Now we got to tell you why you're doing it. And we got to show you that when you do it this way, it's going to work. Mm. And with coaches now, you know, you've gone, you go through the coaches and you've we've heard all the horror stories, and we heard these, you know, there's demanding guys and there's guys who are abusive, and you know, I've, there's there's a lot of different stories out there about coaches. But I don't think it's bad to be demanding. In fact, you have to be if you're going to be a coach. There are certain non-negotiables that you have as a coach that you have to have if you're going to be successful as a coach. But the way that you deliver those messages, the way that you work with players, you have to understand that players now are different. They're more sensitive now. They're smarter too. Their IQ is, I mean, they, they know the game. Mark Habscheid, who coaches Ozzy Weisblatt in, in Prince Albert, he has a saying, and I really like it, that the players have to know how much you care about them before they care about how much you know. And, and I really like that. And it, it sums it up perfectly. 
and Habby was, you know, Habby grew up in the 80s and, and, and 90s and, and played junior back in the days when coaches kicked you in the ass when you weren't doing the right thing and the coaches yelled at you all the time and benched you and things like that. Now you got to show the player that you care about them, that you know who they are, you know what's important for them. And you have to be able to, to get out of them without squeezing it out of them. You, you massage it out of them as much as, as you can. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a work in progress. And you always think it's a work in progress. It's a work in progress. And, and you keep working with them. Now, as they get older and they become veterans, you don't have to be as... Coddling. As, um, yeah, <laughs> exactly. As soft, as soft is not the right word. As um, fatherly. But, yeah. but you know what? Coaching is a lot like raising kids. It really is now. Because hell, the kids aren't. Look at the ages of the kids that they're playing. Well, so you know that's a long answer for for Kevin LeBanc. That I think you just have to be able to find. You know, how do I get get him to understand that even if he doesn't score, he can help us win. Yeah, and play the right way. Yeah, you know? yeah. yeah. So, uh, seeing it's funny you bring that up about the coaching because I will tell you I'm a, kind of surprised at the way that. Calgary has played because I kind of felt like Daryl Sutter is maybe not that kind of a coach. <laughs> Daryl, Daryl is. And I'm like, can he bring the best out of a Johnny yes. hockey kind of a player, you know? Yes. And it's like, and look at what's happened. Daryl is the, the, there's two things I say about Daryl. You can't judge a book by its cover and his bark is worse than his bite. But he, he really is like Daryl is. I, I, I have, I love Daryl. I, I can't tell you how much I love Daryl. I mean, he's, he's such a great, great person. I'll tell you my quick, I, I, there's a bunch of Daryl stories, but I'll, I'll tell you my one about Daryl. Um, he's coaching LA and I'm, I'm doing a bunch of games for NBC. Hold on. This is, this the five guys thing. Yeah. I tell you the story. Right? Yeah. Oh. oh, it's one of the best fucking stories I've ever heard. Are you kidding me? You're talking yeah, about like the guys. NBC guys already got it queued up in the truck. People are shaking from laughing so hard. <laughs> his brother, his brother sought me out after it said, I was, if I had your phone number, I was going to fucking call you because I was so funny. Well, yeah, but, Dar but that's Daryl. Daryl makes me laugh. I mean, Daryl says these things, but then, you know, we're, we're in LA and I brought my boys with me to, to a game. And after the game, press conference, right? And people are standing there waiting and waiting and waiting to say something or ask a question and they're like this. And and the reason they're waiting is because Daryl's over talking to my boys for like five minutes. You know, <laughs> hey boys, how are you? He's the what Daryl does, he sets expectations and he holds you to them. Here's the bar and this is where we're going to be. And it's it's listen, if you want to play that way, you play that way. If you don't, your ice timer will reflect that I don't think you're trying to do what you're trying to do. But he also is able to get the best out of individuals. Look at Milan Lucic. Milan Lucic might score 20 goals this year. <laughs> now why? Daryl loves him. Big bugger, Daryl, he's good. A big, a big bugger over in Boston, you know? But <laughs> when he was in with him in LA for that little bit, Milan, he, he looks at him like a father figure. Look at Johnny Gaudreau. Look at Monaghan, guys. Well, I, was, I was just going to say, that's the thing, though. Lucic, to me, Sutter-type player. Gaudreau, Gaudreau, not so not, much. Right? <laughs> but to me, and I, I know somebody else and I talked about, we, we, were, we were talking about that. You know what a Sutter player is? Guy that gives you everything he's got, no matter what type of player he is. If you give me my, if you max out effort, if you give me what I'm asking for, then you are my type of player. And if you produce, you're my type of player. If you don't, if you dog it, or if I don't think you're you're giving everything you got, you're not my type of player. Boy, I, you know, I, I know. Daryl's Daryl's he's a he's a size son of a gun. You know, Daryl is way softer than people think he is. Like, he's got a good heart. Like, I I get to tell here's you. Here's Daryl. Here's Daryl. Okay. First year, I think it was. Tony Granada, we're in St. Louis. End of the game, Tony Granada goes to the front of that. We pulled the goalie, and Doug Bodger hits Tony Granada in the face with a slap shot. Tony's spitting teeth, literally spitting teeth as he's skating off the ice. Uh, by the way, Tony never went down, by the way. Full in the face, broke his jaw, smashed his face, didn't go down. Skated to the bench. Last game of the road trip. Um, 
we get on the plane. Tony's coming back with us. His head is wrapped like a Civil War vet, right? Bernie Nichols is sitting beside him, dabbing the blood and saliva off his chin. As This is now, a, we're flying from St. Louis to San Jose, right? <sighs> and Danny, it was a radio game only. Danny and I are looking back there where he's sitting and we're going, jeez, Louise, oh my goodness. And Daryl's standing there looking at him. Daryl goes, lucky. And I went, what did you just say? He goes, he's lucky. Daryl, lucky doesn't really, like, that's not the first thing I'm thinking of when I look at Tony Granato right now. Now, how the, is he lucky? And, Tony, and Daryl goes, didn't hit him in the eye. And I went, do you practice at being like this or does this just come natural? And he looks at me dead in my eye, looks at me in the, dead, dead in the eye and goes, you just don't fucking get it, do you? <laughs> okay, so then we sit down, we take off and we are, we get to cruising altitude, maybe, okay? We're just getting there. And Danny goes, Drew, look. I said, what? He goes, look. And I turn back and I look. Daryl's behind Tony now, massaging his shoulders and neck. I, and stood there for ever, just rubbing his shoulders and neck to make sure he was relaxed and okay. <laughs> So that is bark way worse than the bite. <laughs> so if I had any balls whatsoever, I would have walked by and went, you marshmallow, but I didn't. So. <laughs> well, that was the thing that always struck me with Sutter. It's like you would look at a cat like uh, Ricci or a Scott Thornton or an yeah. Owen Nolan or even a Damfus, where it's like, okay, yeah. these are Sutter type players. And then I always wondered if I, it always felt like maybe Coral Uke was not a Sutter yeah. guy. Didn't get because all of a sudden, Corey, you seem to be a lot better once Wilson was in the house. Yeah, well, that's, you know? it, that's, that's not unusual, though. Yeah. You know, that's not was... unusual at all. It's, it's, you remember that series against St. Louis, Game 7? He took Alex, he took Corky out of the, the lineup <laughs> for Game 7. John no. Ferguson was freaking furious. <laughs> um, he put Ronnie Stern in, and who scored in that game? Ronnie Stern. No. Uh, that's, you know what? But then, lots of guys, lots of guys play. You know, it depends. Like, yeah, quirky, probably not Daryl's type of guy, but you know. Well, and that's why I was like looking at Gaudreau, and I went, "Oh shit!" <laughs> but hey, <laughs> it's working. Yeah, it works. Uh, but when you when you look at the coaching staff with the Sharks, though, what finds what I find really interesting with the coaching staff of the Sharks, they've really got different energy levels. I mean, they're really like Bob's high energy guy. Like he hides it when he's talking press, but he's a high energy guy. You watch him on the bench. He, he's got a lot of feedback. You watch him on the ice, he's, he's a lot of feedback. Johnny and Johnny and John, a little bit lower, okay? Reach is on the ice when he's with practice. He's big energy, okay? Off the ice, very, you know? And Nabby is just energy all the time. You know, they've got a really neat, you know, Danny Darrow and, and Charlie Townsend, they've got a really nice mix there. They got guys who are, you know, analytics guys and smart video guys. They've got guys who are like Johnny McLean and Johnny Madden who are in Reach and Navi or longtime NHLers. Bobby is a guy who had to bust his ass to be an NHLer and he's successful as a junior coach. They've got a really interesting mix, and it's it's kind of been fun to watch. You know, as as a you know failed coach, I sit back and I watch these guys and how they work, and I go, all right, it's working. I wasn't sure at the start, but it worked for this team. Well, I'll tell you, when Bugner was out for those few games on protocol. Yeah, Johnny did a nice job. I thought he was fantastic. Yeah. And those media, huh? Experience. Yeah. Well, those media sessions, there's a couple of them where I'm like, are they going to throw a mirror under his nose so you can see <laughs> he's breathing? Like, he was just very, yeah. just very yeah. even keel. Yeah. Uh, um, what's your take on Hurdle? At this point, you know, it's like the Sharks are playing 500 hockey. Last time I looked, doesn't get you to the playoffs. And no. we all know Hurdle wants to win. And whether. I don't know, I don't know what, I, I, who knows what he's going to, like, who knows what he's going to do. The one thing that I, that I see this year, um, and it's, it's certainly, you know, through rumors and everything else and innuendo, we heard that wasn't the case last year. There's, there's a lot of guys smiling and Hurdle seems to be one of them. He seems to be like being around these guys and they like around being around him. Um Highly skilled, obviously. We know about his 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 ability as a player. I mean, 
but what you earn at the free agency is the, the chance to go get your money and get a chance to go to a team that now the question is, well, will Doug and Joe will and Doug jr. Will they look at that? And, you know, if depending on the playoff situation, depending on where they are at the trade deadline, will they go, if we don't have a commitment from them, do we move them for prospects? Do we move them for picks? Do we move them for a player and picks? Because there will be a team, there will be several teams who are yeah. going to inquire about, I and mean, who haven't probably, who have already, about yeah. Tomas Hurdle. Yeah, I mean, kid, right in the middle of his prime, you know, right. <laughs> you know will probably be a top center on half the teams in the league. Yeah, exactly. So. And there would be a team, there'd be a team like looking to, to make the move and think they've got all the, almost all the pieces in place that they're probably making some phone calls to Joe Will and, and Doug right now going, <laughs> okay. What Does do you Minnesota, want? Minnesota have their top? Uh, yeah, picks? they're okay. Huh? Yeah, they're okay. That's it. By, yeah. by the way, another original San Jose Shark, Dino Everson, doing a fantastic job with that team. But I'm Just, going, do, they have, do they have their number one pick right now still? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I don't know if they do or not. So there's not going to be too freaking high anyway. So. Yeah. Um, Hey, what are your thoughts? And if you don't want to talk about it because you're just fucking sick of it, I get it. But uh, just what do you think the final outcome is for uh, the Sharks and uh, Kane? Like, do you think he returns? Does he get traded? Does he just get bought out? Just I don't think we. So Joe Will brought up a really good point, and many of us were thinking, you know, just pay him to go away, right? Yeah, that's what. That's many of us were. T- that's, that was the constant theme. You wouldn't believe how many calls and texts I got from people. Eastern Canada media center, hockey people. What are you guys doing with Kane? What are you doing with Kane? And I finally said to a guy who's a good friend, but um, he's one of the hockey insiders. I went, I don't know if you know this about me or not, <laughs> but Doug doesn't run a lot of stuff by me. <laughs> you know? I don't know if you looked at my job title, but front yeah. fucking office is yeah. not part of it. <laughs> Ain't it. And, you know, <laughs> special assistant or consultant to the general manager, that's not there either. So I'm not sure why you keep frigging calling me because I don't have any answers for it. And I don't have any answers. But um, what what Joe Will said was, because when he had the conference call with us, with the media, they asked him about, well, why did you send Barracuda? He said, well, he's under contract. He is is a contracted player and he has rights as a contracted uh, athlete in this organization. We had to put him somewhere because he's a contracted player. So they put him with the Barracuda. Roy Sommer has said he has been wonderful with that team. He has been fantastic as far as being a good team guy, always being on time, um, showing up and playing well. Well, we had, well, I had you know, five points in three games last time I checked and then, you know, had played, had been, had great rave reviews. I don't know about, and this is what I, nobody knows about what the team feels about him and how he feels about the team. I mean, the guys in the room. Yeah. Now we heard we've had guys written and or, or people have written about it, but I can tell you from being in that room when I was coaching, the only people who know what's going on in that room is the people in that room. Mm-hmm. The, the only thing I would say is that from sources here in Canada, there have been, a number of teams. Now, a number, whatever that means when somebody tells you that, a number of teams could be one. Yeah. It is a number. One is yeah, a number. Last I checked. Yeah. Um, that have inquired about Evander King. I don't know what they're going to do with him. I have no idea. And again, that's so above my pay grade that the only thing I will say is that I do think that by him going to the Barracuda and what Roy has been saying about him, says that he's trying to trying to do the right things good first step yeah all right and that's all it is you know has patrick marlowe played his last nhl game yeah i think so yeah as sad as i am about it i was hoping like you know so if they don't go to the olympics the nhl teams the nhl players because of the vid if they and, don't and, I, olympics, and i think we're about what 48 hours or less from them yeah. calling you know, that. It, was, it was interesting i was i was hearing an interview with uh one of the uh, I think it was the director of player personnel for team Canada. I can't remember exactly what his title was, but he was saying that they had a conference call with some players yesterday and that just to, Hey, he said, we're still moving ahead with NHL players. All right. 
That's that's what they're doing. One of the guys who's really pushing from the player's side to still go is Sidney Crosby. Really? A guy who's got two gold medals, a guy who scored the biggest goal in Canadian hockey history, um, a guy who's won championships, has got it all, has done it all. Apparently, he's really pushing. And, and um, so they were pretty, I think, because Sid wants to kind of pay it forward with Connor McDavid and you know, and, and Nathan McKinnon and some of the other great young talent in, in Canada, Mish Marner, guys like that. But Hockey Canada also has a team in Moscow right now who were playing, I guess, some uh, exhibition games in Russia. They've also got a Spengler Cup team, although they now canceled that team from going to Davos to play in the Spengler Cup. And Claude Julien will be coaching the non-NHL players if it goes there. It'll be XF, um, free agents, uh, guys who are playing in the K, guys playing in Europe. Canadians all over the place. That's at least Hockey Canada's idea anyway. And I imagine Team USA is the same thing. And I was kind of hoping that if it was not NHL guys, that Patty might go. Might, oh, Patty no. might be one of the guys they talk to. But I don't know if he's even skating or anything. But, yeah, I, yeah, I think he has. I, I, I'm happy in one respect because he's had a wonderful career. Oh, yeah. And he is, as we all know, one of the top notch guys and ever put on a shark's uniform, but I'm kind of sad because it's over. Yeah. You know, well, and here's a, just a, I don't know. A, a, sometimes I have dark thoughts. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. As of today, Joe Thornton is a full NHL, NHL season, right? Yeah. 82 games played from tying Patrick Marlowe. Is that right? right? 82 games right now he's 82 games behind panthers the panthers have 53 games left on their schedule this season so you think that's a record that thornton would would like to try to break or i mean and because there's got to be a team out there that is going to be like yeah jumbo here's you know a million and a half because we want you to break that record wearing yeah, he's, our... playing for, he's, he's playing for the minimum now isn't he but that, yeah bucks. but there there okay, might let's... be a couple teams that are so it, look hockey is a business they like to sell merch you're gonna tell me that there might i'm not saying a huge bidding war but there might be a couple teams that say hey we'll give you a mil five to break that record wearing our jersey yeah but he's He's played 18 games. He's only got three goals and two assists. <laughs> Big fucking deal. You know, it's like you're playing, you play fourth line winger. You're going to play eight minutes a night. Yeah. You, but you're going to, you're going to, I don't know, but you're going to break the record buddy. Or I do you know. think he has like enough? I, I don't want to say it's, it's a, a respect thing, but oh. do you think he, I mean, as much as he does respect Marlo, the, it almost makes me wonder like if Thornton would be like, okay, I'm going to play up to 1778. You know, but I'm a- <laughs> I don't know, buddy. That's a, that's a big hypothetical. I don't know. One thing about Jumbo is that and this, it was 2016 when they went to the, when they went to the cup Yeah. and they, and Joe was on the, the, uh, with the press conference and they asked Joe about winning the cup and he went, I know I'm a good hockey player. And what it meant to his legacy, he goes, I'm going to know I'm a good hockey player. He said, I've been a great hockey player for a long time. I know that. Because if I don't win the cup, I don't win the cup. He said, it doesn't change the fact that I was a really good hockey player. Absolutely. I mean, Joe's pretty comfortable with who Joe is. I'm, I'm not sure that, I'm, I don't know if it burns in him to, to break those types of records. He's the first ballot Hall of Famer no matter. Yeah. He's really close to Patty. I don't know. I, I, I really don't know. I just wonder if there would be some team that would just sit there and just, I don't know, man. You know, come, come, yeah, come going here. up like they used to. Uh, yeah. Well, here, let's finish off the hat trick of former Sharks captains, then, right? Okay. Uh, we know there aren't many in the mold of a Chelios or a Yager, a Messier, Joe Thornton, even Ray yeah. Whitney. Yeah. Uh, how much longer does Pavelski go? I mean, at 37, he currently leads his, his team in almost every offensive stat. Uh, nearly point yeah. per game player. His faceoff winning percentage, I last I looked, better than Couture and Hurdle. Self-made superstar, man. Yeah. He works his ass off at his game. I don't know how long Joe goes. Did you see him after uh, Tanner Carroll that year? Oh, yeah, absolutely. So, one, it tells you 
So if people didn't see it after Tanner Kiro, kid plays for Dallas, got hit by uh, um, Brett Connolly. Brett Connolly? No. No, no I think you're right. Yeah, Brett Connolly yeah. hit him. Uh, textbook interference, knocked him out four games, got to be stretched off the ice. Uh, Dallas comes back, scores a couple goals, and that, they asked Joe about it, and Joe reminisced about the time and broke down, broke down in tears. And this is very unusual for Joe because Joe's not emotional. He plays with emotion. He's usually quite in control. Um, broke down about that hit and how he had been there before and how my teammates rallied around me. Mm -hmm. And you could tell, and that was kind of where he really started, how much that moment, again, 2019 against Vegas meant to him. You know, he had the serious injury. The guys rallied around him and had that amazing comeback. And he really broke down during that. And he, and he talked about Kiro, about how great of a kid this guy is and how hard he works. And he just comes and just does his job and everybody likes him. And what that says to me about number one is Joe Pavelski, the person that we already knew, but just affirmed it, that, that he is a caring, compassionate, empathetic, wonderful leader and loves his teammates and loves the people that he plays hockey with. Yeah. I, I, I text Tommy Holy today and said, give Pavs a hug for me. And, you know, he's just, even with his bad taste in licorice, um, tell him that he's, uh, he's, he's the man. He likes red vines. I like Twizzlers. It's, it's, it's a whole thing with, between us. Um, <laughs> but when you see a guy that cares that much still about the people he plays with, I think the answer is Joe Pavelski keeps playing for as long as Joe Pavelski wants to keep playing. And again, he got to be where he is through nothing but determination and hard work. Well, he's a, he was a real, he was an incredible athlete. He is an incredible athlete. He's really good athletically. And when you, I think an athlete nowadays, I asked a scout a couple of years ago, what do you look for in, uh, in players now? So we look for athletes. I went, he goes, yeah. He said, we're tired of drafting hockey players. We want athletes. Because kids now, they play hockey, 365, all the time. And they, 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 they quit their, once their season's over, they go, to, they go to camps. Once their camp is over, they go to uh, individual um, summer schools. And then they go work with a trainer. And they do this thing. They want athletes. Joe's an athlete. And the reason they want athletes is because athletes are easy, easily adaptable and athletes have a work ethic. These hockey players, they have a work ethic, but it's a different work ethic. Joe's work ethic is bar none, best I've ever seen. And it goes back to the old story. When his rookie year, Ron Wilson brought him in that exit interview and said, oh. you're my 13th guy, Joe. Yeah. If you don't do this, 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 you're not going to be anything more than the 13th guy. And he, he was the football. one who started the shooting club, right? Jay shooting club with Jay Woodcock. Yep. Yeah. But he was the guy, he would be in front of the net, tipping everything. And there's nobody better and still in the national hockey, nobody better in the NHL than Joe. So Joe plays for as long as Joe wants to play because he he loves the game that much and has put so much into his own career to be a self-made superstar, has championship habits, and he loves the guys he plays with. Just uh, incredible, wonderful. yeah, incredible guy. Miss that guy too. Yeah, absolutely. Well, yeah, of course. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, who doesn't want that in the room? Yeah. Uh, and so finally, before we let you go, and I only bring this up because I heard it on the broadcast when I was listening with you and Rosie, and it just made me laugh. And I'm like, I gotta ask about this. For you, what is the thing that just drives you absolutely insane more? Hearing somebody say wall instead of boards or leaving your feet. Waving your feet. Waving your feet. <laughs> Nothing drives me crazier than guys. He left his feet. Where do you leave him? Did, I mean, what, is he okay? Because that, that sounds serious. <laughs> left his feet drives me nuts. You can jump. You can elevate. You can, your feet can leave the ice. Yes. You can propel yourself into the air. You can do <laughs> lots of things, but you can't leave your feet. Impossible. Oh, here's the other God. one though, midair. So here's okay. <laughs> midair. This, this is how <laughs> this is how nuts I am. Okay. Um, Sean Madison, producer extraordinaire for yes. all the sharks broadcasts. I take everything literal, 
And it, when I hear something now, I text Sean on purpose because I know it pisses him off when I do this. And he just, he comes back with all kinds of really nasty things. But once he came back with, okay, that one I get. Le- leaving his feet, half wall. Where, where, where's the half wall? Why is it, is it, what is it? Shorter? Is it sh- well, where's the half, half wall? Um, Mid air. Was there high air and low air? Like, what, where's that? Right. Yeah. Uh, tripped up. No, you, you fall down when you get tripped. You don't, you don't go up, you fall down. <laughs> so this is that, this is the stuff that I think about during a game when I hear a broadcaster, I go, no. Oh, here's my latest one. And I, and I, I do this a lot. Unbelievable. No, it's not. I just saw it. I was, how is that? <laughs> how is that unbelievable? It, it happens all the time. We live What an unbelievable goal. No, it's not. It, Friggin' happens all the time. Um, yeah, so that's I honestly do that all. I, I honestly hear things like that, and I'll send Madison a text as soon as I hear it, and it just it drives him crazy. <laughs> I really enjoy doing it because you know it shows you how much of a lunatic I am. But um, Jeff Solomon, who is now assist uh, interim general manager with Anaheim Ducks, right? All right can't remember he was with LA for the longest time and he was this one of their guys was suspended or getting a suspension and Jeff said he didn't leave his feet on the hip and I heard it okay next time I saw Jeff and I love Jeff he's such a good dude man he's so funny I said Jeff I need to talk to you about something <laughs> I said have you ever left your feet and he went what are you talking about? I said, no, you said that so-and-so left his feet. Have you ever left your feet? And he went, well, yeah. I, mean, when, you know, I said, no, no, you haven't. You've probably jumped, <laughs> but you've never left your feet. In fact, who you're talking about jumped into the hip. Didn't leave his feet. Of course not, because that would be a real serious injury <laughs> that you left your feet because your feet would be, you know, what is it? It's a saw m- movie. Right? So, but leave your feet is my, Leave your feet is my one. That's that's the that's the one that got me going, and now I won't stop. Now I just continue to be that literal a hole. That <laughs> when you hear me say something and get on it, you think, Remenda, you really have to get a hobby. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, thank you so much for joining us again. It's always a pleasure to talk to you. Well, we rambled today, didn't we? Holy mackerel. People are going to just be clicking off. You know what they're going to do? They're going to think, AJ, you are amazing. Just let that guy ramble on. And Remenda, you've got some issues. <laughs>